We've been joined by Professor Samuel Kobina Enim. He is the government statistician. And a few issues have come up regarding the recent announcements that the 2021 uh, population and housing census will happen. Um, it was supposed to have happened in 2020, by the way, but I'm sure you read the releases from the uh, statistical service explaining why it couldn't happen. But we'll kickstart the conversation with the results of the Ghana Census of Agriculture. I remember fondly how that was done between 2017 and 2018. Prof, good morning and thank you very much for your time. Good morning. You look very well. I'm good. Thank you. How is the statistical service doing? The statistical service is going through um, some transformation and this is because of the data revolution that as a global um, economy we are experiencing. So now we have different sources of data that requires Ghana Statistical Service to be abreast with how we catch up with the data collection exercise. And, and so far it's been good. The, the kind of paradigm shifts that you wanted to bring on, is it working? Are people accepting the change? I would say it's been good because the need for a change was obvious. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't just have said we're not going to do it. And we went about it by sensitizing colleagues in terms of what is happening in the international front. So once that sensitization and benchmarking exercise was done in terms of what is happening in other um, countries, specifically mm -hmm. the Office of National Statistics in the United Kingdom mm -hmm. and Statistics Denmark in Denmark, colleagues of um, Ghana Statistical Service were up to it for the change. Let's zoom straight into the uh, census on agriculture. I know that a lot of work had gone on. People teased that you were counting plants and, and trees and all of that. The report has been launched. Now what? The Ghana Census of Agric, as we indicated the last time was in 1984-1985 and in 2017-2018, as you indicated, we started a data collection exercise. The objective was for us to understand the structure of the, of the agriculture sector. This is particularly important because if you think about the sectors of, a, of the economy, i.e. the agriculture sector, the industry and the services sector, and you don't relate it in terms of how over time the development of the country is linked to an integration across these sectors, then there is a challenge. So if you did the census um, 33 years ago mm -hmm. and you don't know the structure of the economy, mm -hmm. you cannot move on. So now we have a good sense of what the structure of the economy mm -hmm. is as of 2017, 2018. But, but, but we kept boasting that we are an agrarian society, that you know we, we export food, uh, we, have, we have need some regions at bread basket and all of that. Are you suggesting that we didn't really have empirical facts to support that? Far from that, what we meant by we are an agrarian economy should be looked at from different perspectives, okay. i.e. in terms of what is the contribution of the agriculture sector to our gross uh, domestic product. And also we can look at it from the perspective of the number of people who are engaged in that sector, or as you said, specifically the foreign exchange that we are earning from it. As we speak, agriculture sector based on the quarter 2 2020 gross domestic product mm -hmm. contributes just 19% to the economy. And what that means is that the services sector, which is driving the economy, mm -hmm. is contributing almost half, which is about 48.8%, right. and the industry sector is contributing 32%. Mm -hmm. So from a contribution to a GDP point of view, you cannot say that the economy is agrarian. But on the other side, if you think about the proportion of people who are in that sector, mm -hmm. and you know that you're about 36% of Ghanaians in the agriculture sector, then it's driving the proportion of people mm -hmm. that we have in that sector. How do we do the bridge? So you mentioned service, you mentioned industry, you mentioned agric. The government has been talking about one district, one factory, for example, planting for food and jobs, uh, planting for export and rural development. How relevant will this census you know, be to this triangular agenda to make sure that we add value to what we produce? So as you rightly said, the concept one district, one factory, if you look at it from the agric point of view, and we are going to get the raw materials from the agriculture sector to feed the industries that we are building in the district, mm -hmm. then this is the integration that we need in the country. Okay. As we move on, we should not be reliant on the consumption of our own produce. And this is one of the main findings that we get from the agriculture sector. Mm -hmm. Agriculture in this country is characterized by consumption of own produce. Right. So what that means is that we are not using our agricultural as raw materials to feed our industry to the extent that 
um, it, 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 we deserve. Mm. Four recommendations, in fact, uh, six, I must say, recommendations that emanated from uh, the, the census that we did on that quick. One says promote agriculture as a viable business among the youth. Two, mainstream gender and disability issues in agriculture. Three, enhance production efficiency and yield in agriculture. Four, diversify agricultural production. Five, improve agricultural value chain systems. And six, enhance the use of agricultural statistics for policy making. I'm interested in one and six. One, because the youth will be the workforce. A lot of young people technically would see a great as a form of punishment because while, while they were in school, if they misbehaved or offended the law in school, they were given classes to go and read. So some of them still look at a great as a form of punishment. What did your census results prove? And which is why you're making this recommendation? Thank you. So for the sake of the audience, let me relate this to the findings that led to this um, recommendation. It's important we distinguish between persons who are engaged in agri mm -hmm. and holders of an agricultural activity. Right. So you can be engaged in an agricultural um, activity, but not necessarily a holder of, uh, of an agricultural activity. And from the census that we um, conducted in 2017, 2018, from both perspectives, we realized that just about 25%, a quarter of persons engaged in agri or holders of agri constitute the youth. Mm. So the youth constitute just about 25%. Indeed, the percentage is just around 24.7. If you, if you talk about persons engaged in agri and when you talk about holders, the percentage is just about 27. Even though the population of the youth in Ghana is quite large, yes. what, accounted, what, what accounts for people not necessarily want to take themselves into agri? So let me, let me put the finding in, in a context before I try to um, give suggestions on why the youth are not involved. So what I'm saying here is that if we don't have the youth as holders, the way we want to interpret it should be seen differently from persons who are engaged in agri. Okay. So if the youth are not holders, then possibly the capital outlay to attract the youth into agri, it's heavy. Okay. So if our credit systems, if our financial arrangements for the youth are not well structured out, then they will not find the entry that easy because they are now starting their right. engagement. The other thing that we, we thought about is the fact that we've not packaged agriculture as a viable business mm -hmm. in the sense that if you know agriculture is a long-term activity, most of our tree crops mm -hmm. takes quite a long time for um, the first um, harvest to occur. So if you look at it from that point of view, and we don't have financial packages that runs into 10 years, into 20 years, and all our financial packages are two, three years, then definitely it cannot finance the kind of activity that we need from them. The other perspective that we think we should look at is the whole educational system, how it prepares the youth to go into our Greek. Because one of the findings from what we did showed that about 80% of holders do not have education or at best have basic education. So those who are in agri, by implication, the youth that we are concerned about, most of them do not have what it takes to appreciate the technology required to drive a productive agricultural sector. So indeed, this is, these are findings that it's important we look at it from an integrated point of view okay. rather than trying to solve the problems mm -hmm. inside. A po policy will drive this, and you are recommending that the detail of your um, finding will influence policy strongly. Where are we in that drive? I must say that in the last um, few years, as we've all seen, we've, we've seen quite tremendous um, interventions in the agricultural sector. I think what we need to do immediately is, this data was collected three years ago. So now we should go on an agenda of establishing whether the interventions that on top of our head we knew that was what is needed really aligns with the findings mm -hmm. and in the next two, three years shape the kind of policies that we want. So for instance, uh, the ministry is investing a lot in warehousing. Okay. This is an opportune time, which I'm not saying it's a bad thing, mm -hmm. but this is an opportune time for the ministry to sit down and say that is warehousing the dominant um, intervention no, that the sector happen. needs. Mm -hmm. Or now that we found that for faith mm -hmm. of people in agri do not have education, we should think about how we can structure some educational packages for those in the agricultural sector. Thank you. Well, let's move on now from agri and talk about another kind of census, the population and housing census. What's supposed to have happened in 2020? 
Um, we started the journey in 1960. It's come all the way. Uh, 2010 was the last one that we had, and 2020 had been earmarked for another one. It didn't happen. Why? I mean, the obvious reason is COVID-19 and uh, related restrictions that came with it. Indeed, at the time that we had our first incidence, that was on the 12th of March, we had reached an advanced stage with our preparation towards the census. And what I mean specifically by that is we had conducted two, the two trial censuses that we needed to do to enable us to understand how we're going to go into the main census. We had started with our training. We had finished with our um, census mapping, the field work. We had gone into the field and demarcated the country into 51,000 um, enumeration areas. Mm -hmm. So indeed, we had reached an advanced stage with our preparations ahead of the census. But as it was, COVID-19 dictated the pace, especially when um, the president announced that we should put restrictions on gatherings, put a cap on 25 people. And there's an activity that if you put in totality, we're going to engage more than 80,000 people in the entire exercise. So clearly we couldn't have proceeded with, 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 with the census as it were. Mm -hmm. So what we did was to start um, assessing the impact of COVID-19 from the perspective of when it's going to abate, when Ghana would reach its plateau, then we can make a decision in terms of when we could do it. Mm -hmm. But because this year was an election year, the only option that we could um, consider as at that time, that was in March, was shifting the date from June to somewhere in September because as we're all experiencing now, this high political season and there's a lot of movement going on in the country. So we couldn't have just done the census any time between October and December. Well, so then so the question will arise that we're supposed to have done it in 2020. It would inform our decisions, how to plan for people, infrastructure, blah, 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 all these sectors. Now we didn't have it in 2020. Does it change anything in terms of planning for the lives of the people, knowing how many people there are, the kind of houses they live in, and what social uh, stuff we could give to the people. Does it change anything? Analytically, yes. And the reason why I say that is, when we do the population housing census, which is a decennial um, activity, we do annual projections. And as we speak, we all know that our population projected um, figure is about 31 million. Now, what this means is that we still have to rely on the 2010 projections for, 20, for the year 2020. Mm -hmm. So the reliability of the 10-year projection that we, 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 we've, we've been doing over the period is more or less weakened as we do not do the census in the year that we, we are required to do it. But thankfully, we now have some statistical and demographic models okay. that allows us to do some age cohort adjustments. And that is what we're going to do for the year um, 2020 in terms okay. of projections and we're going to reconcile that with 2021. Mm -hmm. And what these models allow us to do is to sort of move the age cohorts back and forth. Okay. So if we are doing it in 2021 now, we are hopeful that in 2030, we're going to do the next one. Okay. That would give us an intercensor period mm -hmm. of 11 years and nine years. And again, with the aid of these statistical and demographic tools, we are able to move the age cohorts to predict our annual. Clearly it's going to be a lot of work. Do you have the men? Do you have money? The census for 2020 round, I call it 2020 round because when the UN blocks 2020 as the year for um, population census, the duration is really from 2015 to 2024. So government was really committed to the exercise. So in terms of funding, when we presented the 477 million Ghana cities to the president, 85% of that money has been secured for the census. So from a financial resource point of view, Ghana Statistical Service is prepared to go into it. The only hurdle that we need to clear now is the challenge of accommodating the implications of COVID-19. So hitherto, we're going to put about 50, 60 people in a class to train them. Mm -hmm. But now we need to think about 30, 40, which means we're going to have more classes, we're going to have more days. And now we're thinking about another trial census um, and also redo some of the census mapping um, exercise. So that might come with an, an additional cost, but we are pretty optimistic that it wouldn't move um, the census activity preparation in any direction. As of the time you were planning for this, Corona hadn't stepped in heavily. So the provision of PPEs, mm -hmm. for example, for your field staff. By the way, do you have the field staff? Have you started recruiting? What stage are we? Indeed, we've recruited at all levels for our field staff. And indeed, the 
um, application is still open. We need 75,000 men and women for the field exercise. And in our database, we currently have close to 190. I must say that we are not really interested in the aggregates. We are interested in the distribution okay. because the census requires that we go into every locality. And per the way we do it, we require people from within the enumeration area, the locality to do the enumeration. We don't want to move people from one geographical area to the another, simply because you are collecting data and people feel more comfortable with knowing the person who is doing the data collection. And we need about 15,000 people to train at the different um, levels. And also our application for national training, regional training, it's live. We've exceeded our numbers in that regard, but we're still, we're still keeping it open because, as I said, we need a distribution to do that because it's much more expensive recruiting people from Accra to go and train in the different um, parts of the country. So we are using this platform to encourage people with second degree, first degree who are interested to become national trainers, regional mm -hmm. trainers, to apply using our numerator bureau platform. The concern that they may not get their monies, their allowances, or if you like honorarium after they have served their nation, trying to give detail and statistics has always been there. Uh, what assurance do they get? They're going to be paid when they do their work? The Ghana census of Agric has been the pivot around which this concern has come up. That's and right. it did come up for reasons, I must say, beyond Ghana Statistical Service and to a large extent beyond government, in the sense that we initially planned this exercise over a relatively shorter period. But having, having not done it for 33 years, we realized that it required more than anticipated. So an exercise that was planned for a one-year period has ended up for a three-year um, period. Mm -hmm. That brought about um, spikes in the budget and all that. But in terms of the census, as I indicated, the money is sitting right with Ghana Statistical Service. It's a facility that... Has it been given or it's been approved? There's a difference, you do know. Indeed, there's difference, and I'm happy to explain it. So what I mean by it's been secured is that we are funding the census based on a facility from the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So unlike um, other funding arrangements that we have to rely on other internal sources, this is a facility that has been secured with the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So although the money is not seated in the account of Ghana Studies Card Service, we know it's with World Bank and we uh, arrange with them directly. And the processes are such that on activity basis, you need to write to the World Bank to seek a no objection to get that money. So we do not anticipate having challenges with payment of enumerators, as I indicated, money has been secured for that. PPEs, we need to protect them. Uh, what, what's the plan? Yes, as I indicated, this is why we say that with our current budget, we have 85% of it. Mm -hmm. We've estimated the implications of COVID-19 on the 75,000 people that we're going to put in the field and close to 15,000 trainers that we are going to use. So we are on course in ensuring mm -hmm. that our Phil staff are safe, our trainers are safe, and also the respondents that we're going to speak to by implication are safe. Are we going to leverage on technology? Because the vice president has been talking about digitization here and there. The last time you had your census, I saw the plastic uh, files with the, uh, the sheets of papers and then they were ticking. Are you going to level on technology? Indeed, we are calling this an e-census. Okay. And I can enumerate reasons why we are calling it an e-sense, so, starting with what you just said. So now we are not putting people in the field using papers. We are putting people in the field using tablets. And this is not the first time Ghana Statistical Service is doing it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is the first time that we are doing it on a very large scale because we have in excess of 50,000 enumeration areas. So what that means that we have to procure um, 75,000 tablets because we need to put a larger number. Money. Indeed. It's a larger number that we are putting in for training before we scale down to those that will, will make it to the field. In addition to the use of tablets, there are a number of um, electronic interventions that we are putting in place. As I indicated to you, we are recruiting our field staff, our trainers, based on an enumerator bureau platform. Okay. What this allows us to do is to engage these um, field officers and the trainers way ahead of time. So as I speak to you now, we have a learning management system Although the census will take place in April, May, as the president indicated, we started engaging them on the learning management system. All our materials are there. They go online, they do self-tutorials, mm -hmm. and we are using the platforms that our universities were deploying during COVID-19, i.e. the Moodle, right. the Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. And this is what technology is doing so, for so us. Let me census. understand, Prof. I go to, say, Amransa. I am the field officer there. 
I pick the details. Does it stay on my tablet or does it come to a central point? How does it work? Excellent. So there's another e-sensors that we are putting in place, another intervention that we are putting in place to make it an e-sensors. So we, are, we have our service on premise, but for purposes of the sensors, we are expanding our service and exploring different platforms, i.e. a private cloud service. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that once the enumerator finishes the enumeration, the enumerator would sync to the supervisor okay. and the supervisor will sync in real time to the head office. Head office will review it and we have data monitors in the field mm -hmm. that will pick up all um, outliers, all unexpected um, data and quickly relay the information back to the enumerators. So by the time we leave the field, we are sure that about 80% of all the errors that we would have to correct in the office would be dealt with in the office. So we're going to get access to real time mm -hmm. um, data. The, the consent, so it means that the, uh, analyzing the data will not take so much time uh, like previous years. Okay. Now, there's also been concerns about persons who say, oh, I was not counted. Uh, I was not part of it. I was not home when they came around. And I can confidently say I wasn't counted. How do we cure that problem? We need to do this at two levels. And this is only what Ghana Studies Class Service is doing. One is to intensify our sensitization on this activity because most of the time people say they are not counted mm -hmm. simply because they did not have a face-to-face -face personal interaction with right. an enumerator. Mm -hmm. But if a member of your household is there and is able to provide all the needed information for us, then we need not see every member in the household okay. because if it's a five-member household and I come to meet the head of the household, the head of the household is in the position to provide information for all the other four members in the household. But again, one thing that we are doing now, which is making us say that we are doing an e-census is we are developing an application on our mobile phones, which will be accessible to every person in Ghana. Tell us your experiences. If you feel that the enumeration is ongoing, we are in the last day, we are in the first day, but you've not heard from any, any enumerator, that real-time engagement with the application will be there. Mm -hmm. So quickly, people at HQ would speak to the supervisors on the ground to say that we've had complaints from this particular locality that nobody has been there. This is the fifth day. We need ABCD, ABCD person okay. to go there. So our field strategy escalates the problem to the point that some of them even get to my office when we feel that it's not being attended to at the lower level. The unscrupulous persons would like to put themselves, you know, up like your, your field agents. How do we identify the chaff from the wheat? Indeed, this is also being done at multiple levels, one of it, which I talked to you about. That is what the enumerator bureau allows us to do because it gives us comprehensive information about you. It gives us references, just like we are applying for um, a higher education. Perfect. You need to provide reference letters, and this is only what you are doing because we don't wait till about a, a month to the exercise. We have all this time, and as I said, we have close to 200,000 people. Mm -hmm. We can do all the necessary background checks. And we've already started with face-to-face um, -face screening mm -hmm. of our trainers. So apart from the fact that the online system allows us to do some check, we double that up by doing a face-to-face -face screening. Okay. And during the period that we are engaging with the training, I think the unscrupulous ones would easily fall out because okay. they're going to find the process not interesting. Because as I said, you need to be with us for five to six months mm -hmm. before the exercise itself. So it's okay. going to take only those who are capable and passionate about the national exercise to be with us. There's a ministry for monitoring and evaluation that will wrap up on this one. Um, how closely do you work with that ministry? Because the, the ministry is supposed to be uh, collating data as well, and analyzing them, and feeding government uh, tangible information so that they can use it to improve the, the lives of the people. That's your work as well. What's the collaboration between you and the ministry? I must indicate that the relationship has not been as strong as I would have preferred it. And this is partly because we How didn't... How do you mean? What so you we're, I was expecting a more functional engagement and, a, a, and clarity in terms of what statistical service does and what the ministry also does. Right. And this is what I really want to cl um, clarify. So first of all, we should understand that statistical service per the Statistical Service Act 2019-1003 is the only agency in the country that can designate a statistic as a national statistic. Okay. Apart from Ghana Statistical Service, any other institution that puts up any number 
would be considered as experimental mm -hmm. and it has to go through due processes. So what this law, this um, 2019-1003 allows us to do is to set up a statistical advisory committee, mm -hmm. which is made up of persons from all the ministries, departments and agencies that would meet twice every year mm -hmm. to see how we can harmonize our methodologies, our conceptualizations to ensure that figures that we put out there, even if there are differences, which one expects, because if you conceptualize it differently, if you define it differently and you measure it differently, you don't expect to get the same numbers. Right. But having said that, we need both sides. There's nothing like a bad statistics, but every number should be interpreted in the context that is being computed. And that is what the Statistical Advisory Committee would help us to do. So moving forward, we are hoping that the ministry would come to statistical service, which it does, but we want to increase the regularity because user engagement is our top priority. Have you reached out to the minister? In fact, say, we've, yes, we've had initial discussions on that. But as I said, we wanted to have the legal backing first, which now we have it. Okay. So moving forward, we're going to start our engagement. So one, if I get you, you want clarity uh, of, of purpose, and then you also want regular engagement. So in a year, how many times? Four times? Five times? No, in a year, we're going to meet at the advisory level twice. Okay. But a ministry like the Ministry um, Monitoring, Monitoring and Evaluation, that relationship should be more regular. Because any time we put up a statistic like the Ghana Census of Agric, I think it's the ministry that should go out and see what is not happening or what can be done in a better way. So moving forward, we are hoping that with the development of the codes of Ethics and Practice, to govern statistical production in this country. We are optimistic that all MDAs will come on board to ensure harmonization and increase the use of statistics. Prof, we're wrapping up. Your closing thoughts uh, as we prepare for the 2021 census, April and May, um, what do you say to Ghanaians out there? I take this opportunity to urge all Ghanaians to participate in the, pro in the process. I emphasize the fact that Ghana Statistical Service it's only coordinating the exercise. It's not the only agency that can do the exercise. This, we call it the national priority program because it is the basis by which all our policies emanate. It is the basis by which we do the democracy that we have in this country. And it is by no other reason why we say that we're going to provide trusted official statistics for good governance. So this is a collective call for all Ghanaians mm -hmm. to support the process and anything that they feel is not consistent with their, their expectations, as I indicated, we have different platforms by which they can reach us, i.e. the application or the website that we have at Ghana Studies Class Service. Prof, I thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. But that's been uh, Professor Samuel Kobina Enim Hayes, the government statistician, throwing light on uh, the uh, great census that we had between 2017 and 2018, and also the uh, in impending or intended national population and housing census for April and May 2021. My name is Johnny Hughes. Thank you very much for your time. See you some other time.